My talk is about how the JVM is turning into a polyglot runtime. People are deploying all kinds of languages, mostly dynamic languages on it that aren't Java. So the title may be overly dramatic. The JVM is not dead. Neither is the dog. He's just sleeping. Uh, the JVM is rather turning into uh, a more generic runtime, a polyglot runtime, which is something we find very exciting. Um, as I work for Oracle, here is the uh, mandatory legal slide which says that you can't uh, base any purchasing de decisions on uh, what I tell you today because it might not actually be true. Um, I'm Marcus Dagergren uh, and I work in the Java language team at uh, Oracle. We do things like Java 8, we incorporate lambdas in the Java language, uh, we work a lot with dynamic languages on the JVM, uh, which is what I've been doing for the last almost two years, I guess. Um, I had had some. I've been involved in in, in the Nathorn project, which is um, deploying JavaScript on the JVM and trying to do it as efficiently as possible. Um, I'm based in Stockholm, uh, which is uh, one of the three major JVM engineering campuses that Oracle has, and the biggest one uh, outside the U.S. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you want to see JavaScript rants. I. I tend to post them a lot. So the presentation today is um, the, the agenda is the introduction, uh, dynamic languages, the virtual machine, uh, where we're going, uh, a history of JVM languages and runtimes, because it's always good to, to start with history. And I, I love excuses to show pictures of John McCarthy, the father of Lisp, in my presentations. Um, then we're going to talk about emerging languages and language design on top of the JVM and why you would want to use the JVM as a, a, a language platform for, for languages. And uh, we'll talk about Invoke Dynamic, which is the single most important thing that's happened to the JVM since its inception when it comes to deploying things that aren't Java on it. Uh, how many here are familiar with Java bytecode or have looked at it or played with it or seen it? Oh, well, a few of you. Um, more than half, actually, it's pretty good. How many are familiar with Invoke Dynamic or like casually know what it does? Yeah, okay, so you've got a third of the audience, maybe a little bit less than a third. I'll, I'll talk to you about that. How many are Java programmers? Okay, that's to all of you. I won't lose you. Normally, my presentations contain a lot of like assembly code and stuff, so this is, this is high level. Um, don't be afraid of the bytecode. Um, I'll talk about the Nazarin project, which is our uh, JavaScript implementation on top of the JVM and uh, polyglot programming and projects associated with it. And uh, I'll end by talking about the multi-language JVM effort that uh, we call the DaVinci Machine uh, project, uh, which is part of uh, the OpenJDK, where anyone can join and contribute, where we do things that aren't just JavaScript, God forbid, but all kinds of multi-language extensions to the JVM for all languages like Scala and uh, um, Ruby and whatever you want. So, introduction. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Java runtime, the JVM, that's the core of my presentation. Uh, but as I said, the JVM is rapidly turning into something else. So a colleague at the office said that I'm really here to talk about the uh, universal meta execution environment, which is of course a uh, rather strange um, expression, uh, but it's, it's all about the JVM as a multi-language runtime, and, and especially in, in the context of dynamic languages, because that's what, seem to be, what seems to be happening a lot now. I mean, Scala runs on the JVM, but it's not considered a dynamic language per se, even though it has, like Java, even dynamic characteristics. So we'll try to dissect what we mean by dynamic languages as well. So what is a runtime anyway? Um, we stand on the shoulders of some giants, and, uh, and one of them is, is John McCarthy, of course, the father of Lisp, who created Lisp at MIT in the 1950s, but the most important event here it happened in 1962 when his grad students uh, did the first Lisp compiler, uh, because the interesting thing about this uh, Lisp compiler was that it was a JIT, it was a just-in-time compiler, and uh, I've been doing my research, and I can't find that anyone has done a JIT compiler before 1962. So, so Lisp was, was the seed of um, JIT compilation, which is, of course, how any modern Java virtual machine or other runtime works if it's adaptive and not statically compiled. Um, so first JIT ever, 1962, John McCarthy's grad students. 
And the other thing that was unique in history here was that Lisp had automatic memory management. It had garbage collection through reference counting, which, I mean, not reference counting, but garbage collection certainly is another very fundamental part of a modern runtime for a modern language. So one might say that with the Lisp, Lisp JIT, Lisp compiler, Lisp interpreter, this runtime was the first modern adaptive runtime in 1962. And a lot of our ideas come from there. Uh, the hotspot JVM JIT compiles, it garbage collects, not with reference counting, but the, you, you got the concepts here already. There's another giant in history who is, is Mr. Alan Kay, the, the father of small talk, who gave us things like the first class library. Today we have a JDK. Um, I don't think anyone had came up with the idea of a class library before that they did at Xerox Park. He did the first visual GUI-driven IDE, which is something we take for granted today. Uh, and the great-great-grandchild of this IDE is Eclipse today, actually, by way of Visual Works and other now antiquated uh, IDEs. And he came up with bytecode, which is not a new concept in the 1970s. There were several other um, bytecode attempts, uh, like Pascal and things like that. But bytecode, in the way we think of it, in, in, in the Java world, the uh, right ones to run anywhere, bytecode. Um, that was interpreted originally. So one might see there's nothing new under the sun since. I mean, we have John McCarthy, we have Alan Kay. Has anyone really not invented anything since? And, and concept-wise, this is what we still rely on today. So um, that's the historical retrospective what's going on in the language space. Emerging languages, especially on the JVM, we see that a lot, um, especially dynamic languages. It seems like everyone and his dog is writing his own dynamic language implementation at his university, in his parents' basements, wherever, and posting stuff on the internet. Uh, I did some Wikipedia Googling, and I came up with like five slides like this. OK, it's really gray. You can't really see the contracts, but it's uh, Names of dynamic languages. Um, sorry about the, uh, the palette here. Um, I just picked one of them because it just like didn't end. And, and some of these are actually useful and used in the industry today. But there's slide upon slide upon slide of like dynamic languages. Some of them have their own native runtimes so of people writing C++. Some of them, quite a lot of them, actually compile something like bytecode and execute on the JVM and, and, and various implementations. Uh, but these are the ones that you see. In, in, in the industry. So why would people use dynamic languages? Well, they're getting hot today, even hotter than before, because while well, they've always been fairly easy to use, it's easy to do a proof of concept hack in a dynamic language. Uh, you don't have an explicit compile stage. You get an error, just edit your script and, um, and, and redeploy. Uh, so you, you, you get rid of some overhead there. You have fairly good readability. Java is, is, is quite a verbose language. Um, and uh, that's going to get better with lambdas, and it's going to get even better in Java 9 if we can get things like uh, map literals in there. But normally, dynamic languages are quite uh, uh, not so verbose as, as, as other languages. It makes them easy to read. And um, it's quite easy, as I said, to hack up a proof, proof of concept in, in, in the dynamic language. So this allows for short development time for small projects. And of course, there's the entire Node crowd and, and, and um, JavaScript uh, huggers that say that, I mean, it allows for short development time for any kind of project. But uh, I, I tend not to agree with that. But um, uh, you might. It's, um, it's a religious opinion. So uh, I, would, I would at least grant, grant the dynamic language crowd that it's really fast to do small projects in, in, in dynamic languages. And, and more importantly and more recently, uh, performance is starting to get good enough, which is, of course, the main reason that people are migrating to the dynamic languages today, because dynamic languages have been interpreted or have had slow run times or haven't really been up to um, the performance level that you need to, uh, to do deployments uh, with them. And, and trendy, Ruby is very trendy right now. And, and, and it's interesting because there's a, there's a very good JVM implementation of, of Ruby, JRuby, which actually, in, in many cases, outperforms the, the native Ruby runtime. Um, Python is very trendy. Um, Jython is the Python implementation on the GV JVM. 
and it could actually use a little more developer love. I know a lot of the people who's involved in it, but uh, I haven't seen much action in Jython for a while. I would hope that, that it uh, gets better now and gets some resources now. People seem to be working on PyPy instead, which is, is, is re really cool as well, but not all the JVM. Closure, extremely hot, already on top of the JVM as a JVM language, engineered for that. Groovy, engineered for being on top of the JVM. And of course, JavaScript, with the uh, enormous amount of runtimes that, uh, that uh, supports JavaScript. There's Google V8, which is uh, probably the fastest JavaScript runtime in the world, uh, written in C++, and uh, one of the main reasons that JavaScript started to take off so well. But there's, there's an enormous amount of runtimes, like every browser has its own. Mozilla has the various store monkey uh, runtimes. Uh, there's Rhino, which is the old standby written in Java that people still use today, which is like 18 years old today. Um, and there's Nashorn, which is Rhino's replacement in Java 8, uh, which is a more modern uh, implementation of JavaScript written in Java. Um, JavaScript seems to be like the main dynamic languages um, taking over the software industry right now, which also was alluded to in the, uh, in the keynote yesterday. And, um, I, I don't really know why, I just know that it, like, this is what the world is doing. They're rewriting everything in JavaScript. Everything that can be uh, written in JavaScript will eventually be rewritten in JavaScript, which is, uh, I think one of the Stack Overflow founders said that. Uh, so, like it or not, JavaScript is a, a forest fire spreading to the IT industry now at a very rapid pace. Uh, but if the community has the mindset that all things should be rewritten in JavaScript, then certainly Oracle uh, can have the mindset uh, for platform ubiquity to ma make it possible to run all the things on the JVM. And I'm not, not just talking about JavaScript here, I'm talking about uh, all kinds of languages, dynamic or not. So, concentrating on dynamic languages, how are they implemented? Well. The classic way to implement a dynamic language is to code up a runtime for it and see your C++, some native runtime, compile it, which like Ruby, Perl, Python, Google V8, all the Mozilla spider monkeys do, etc. cetera. Um, the JVM itself is native runtime. You can do it meta-circularly, which is, is, is really cool. You can write part of the runtime in itself, um, which is um, actually quite powerful, as we've seen with the case of PyPy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that project, but Google it. I, I, I'm quite impressed. And uh, what I'm here to tell you about, of course, because I'm from Oracle, is to, uh, to put it on top of a JVM, which is the case for, for several languages that are very popular in this space today. Um, it doesn't need to be the, uh, the Oracle Java Virtual Machine. It could be like a Microsoft uh, DLR, CLR as well, but um, this is, this is what we're concentrating on today, JVM languages and why and what we can do with bytecode and, and the JVM specification to help facilitate this. So, most emerging languages that are deployed on the JVM today are dynamic, uh, but the more I started thinking about what really constitutes a dynamic language, the more I, I came up with um, uh, no clear definition. I mean, what's the, what's the opposite of a dynamic language? Uh, I guess it's a non-dynamic language, but I mean, what is a dynamic language? Is there a formal definition? I'm sure you all have a feel for what, what, what I mean when I say dynamic language, but it's not really clear, like, where is the formal definition? Um, so I'll just try to, to set up a few slides, what I mean, and, and, and compress that with what the JVM was originally written to support, and how we can merge these characteristics for, for performance and efficiency. So dynamic languages tend to be loosely typed which Java certainly is not. Um, you just have a variable X, which is whatever, uh, usually not known at compile time. Um, you have dynamic binding. You resolve things really late. You don't even have a compile time state for resolution, usually in dynamic language, but you resolve uh, a call to X. You only know what X is at runtime and link it and resolve it then. Um, Compared to non-dynamic languages, you have quite a liberal redefinition policy, which means that you can redefine and modify a class or a function or a member. You can add fields to a class in, uh, in, in, in Ruby at, at, at any time, for instance, uh, and, and change the way uh, the, the model of your application looks. Um, you can even redefine built-ins 
in, in, in JavaScript, for instance, you can see that math sign always returns 17. That's perfectly OK. So uh, there's a lot more um, dynamic behavior than we have in, uh, in, in, in a non-dynamic language. Which, of course, is a complication, because if you're implementing Java, you know what math sign <coughs> does. It does what the JVM or the JDK specification says. Uh, but in JavaScript, you have to check if someone has replaced it, which, of course, no one ever does, but you still have to check. So that's uh, one of the challenges of implementing dynamic language. Dynamic languages, code usually equals data. You can pass functions around as, as uh, first-class citizens. You usually have some eval repl uh, shell-like uh, loop where you can evaluate things, uh, but so does Scala, and it's not traditionally thought of as a dynamic language. Um, you practically always have automatic memory management. Um, I don't think anyone doesn't in any modern language anymore. Um, and uh, when you look at the characteristics, the extensions and the redefinition policies and such of dynamic languages, I mean, you can argue that you can extend Java at runtime too. You can unload a class and reload a new version, which subclasses something that wasn't there before. Uh, you can redefine things with class loaders. Um, uh, we, you can change a lot of stuff in Java at runtime, too. So, so maybe the opposite of a dynamic language is, is more like C, something that statically compiles to native code and that doesn't change at runtime at all, uh, which I think is, is, is true. So I'm sort of trying to define a dynamic language by finding its opposite here, which might seem strange, but it's really hard to, to find, to reason formally about it, because anyway, everyone does everything in the language space right now. So, in conclusion, I don't think the dynamic prefix in front of language matters much. What matters is that things change at runtime to a greater or lesser extent, and, and the runtime implementation below your language needs to handle it, and that's what it's all about. Uh, which brings me to putting your language on top of the JVM, which is the main topic, the one, the one thing that we at Oracle want to facilitate with, with these new tools that have been with us from Java 7, but only now are getting really powerful in Java 8. So why? Why would you implement the language and, and um, put it on top of the JVM? Why would you compile your stuff to bytecode and run it on the JVM? Why don't you just hack up your own native runtime? Well, the JVM, it gives you stuff for free. The JVM has manned decades uh, in, in development when it comes to things like the garbage collector. Automatic memory management is automatically given to you. You have state-of-the-art JIT optimizations, also manned decades of work in there. Uh, if you give it bytecode, it can optimize the bytecode well. There is, I'm sort of being um, a bit um, reckless with the truth here because the JVM is very good at optimizing bytecode that used to be Java and not so good yet at optimizing bytecode that used to be something else, but we're certainly getting there. It's just a matter of bytecode can look a little bit alien if you compile another language than Java to bytecode, but it's supposed to be a, uh, a universal uh, runtime format, so that's one of the things that we're working hard on. To, uh, to support better. You have things like native threading capability, atomics, the Java concurrency framework, everything underneath the hood enables you to uh, provide uh, uh, parallelism to the user in any way you choose, callback based or however the JVM implements it for, for you. You have something that I originally scoffed at when I started on dynamic languages, like hybridization. Why would you want to write your language partly in Java? Why would you like a JavaScript program that calls Java, which like the Nasrun runtime does? You have, then I realized it's really, really powerful because you have the JDK below you as well. You can use any library function in the very large JDK to do anything from JavaScript or from JRuby or from whatever you're doing when you're interacting with the JVM. So there's a whole very mature library that you can access, which really uh, makes software development uh, much faster. Uh, we did a proof of concept web server in 80 lines of code, but just using JDK classes rather than JavaScript and deploy it on Nasrn. So I actually recognize that this is the strength. And when you look why people use the slow, old JavaScript runtime Rhino today, 18 years after its inception, it's because of hybridization. It's because they all use it to interact with the uh, Java, the JDK in some way, which uh, we hope people will continue to do so with more performance with the Nashorn project, which I'm getting to as well. So to summarize, as man decades of high tech in the JVM, you get a lot of stuff for free. I hope this slide resonates a little bit with you when you look at code base sizes. What we have here is uh, uh, the number of lines of code in uh, four JavaScript runtimes 
To the left, we have um, Rhino and Nasworn, which are written in Java and run on top of the JVM. And to the right, we have Mozilla SpiderMonkey and Google V8, which are written in C++ and uh, are their own self-contained ecosystems. So we see there's about a factor five difference here of the code we didn't have to write because the JVM provided that very mature functionality already. So, so this is, I mean, the reason why you would want to use the JVM as your universal runtime. So if it were all about code complexity, totally worth it. Why would anyone do anything else? Um, because as we know from David Wheeler, all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection, the JVM being that level of indirection. So implement it. Sound up, serve up some bytecode. I mean, even before Invoke Dynamic and, and fully acknowledge dynamic support from Oracle, people have been deploying things um, as, as bytecode on the JVM that weren't originally Java. They've been doing it a lot. Again, this is like I had five slides of this, but I had to cut it out somewhere to, to, uh, to, to, to limit the scope of what people have been doing with JVM languages. Um, of course, it's not as simple as David Weider says, uh, ironically, of course. Uh, there's a corollary by Kev Kevin Henney that is uh, that, of course, if you have too many layers of indirection, uh, that's, that's still a problem. So that is indeed where the problem lies when you want to save all this complexity by deploying a JVM language, because indirections cost performance, indirection layers cost performance, and they may also not be shaped in a way that you can actually uh, fit what you're trying to do into whatever holes the, uh, corresponding to the APIs that the indirection layer contains. If this white um, brick here with the two round holes is bytecode, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming here with my red uh, rectangle thing with its JavaScript, and it doesn't immediately fit into the bytecode format, so how shall I, how shall I make it better? So, I mean, it, it, it's hard because not everything is a perfect fit for bytecode to run on the JVM even though you have all the memory management and code generation goodness there beneath the indirection level. So why is it hard? There's different levels of hard. I mean, it could be a square peg and a round hole, a round peg and an oval hole. Uh, Scala is a JVM language that actually is a fairly good fit to compile to bytecode. And I originally started writing this slide before I went to the Java Language Summit this summer in Santa Clara and saw Paul Phillips um, previously of TypeSafe's presentation of what they actually do to compile Scala to bytecode. And uh, except for things like tail call optimization and interface injection for traits that the JVM could certainly benefit from implementing, and we're working on that in the multi-language uh, project, the DaVinci project, uh, I got some, some bad mental scars when I looked at the uh, insides of the Scala compiler, the sausage factory, if you will. So I mean, there are some, um, some problems of course, there are some problems fitting things into a program format like bytecode that claims to be platform independent and is platform independent, but still originally was designed from Java, which are problems that we try to aim to solve. But if you look at Ruby or JavaScript, they are, at least at first glance, pretty bad fits for bytecode. Um, they don't even have strong types, whereas bytecode does, even though it's an independent format. So, it's called Java bytecode. Notice the Java. In the JVM specification, there are things like classes, methods, size limitations, strong types. And, and none of these might be relevant to the language you're trying to deploy in the JVM. So languages can be much more dynamic than Java. They can have different runtime-only linkage, and they can have loose types. And, and if you look at Java bytecode in the JVM specification, you have exactly five strong types. You have int, long, float, double, and object. And um, this is the Java method that um, adds two parameters, returns the sum of two parameters. You see the int qualifier here three times. There's no doubt that this method works only on ints, which are 32-bit according to the Java specification. It will compile to bytecode that looks like this. You don't need to understand bytecode. You just need to observe that the bytecodes here start with an I. They're all I prefixed, which means that they exclusively operate on ints. They only they load the two parameters. They execute an add, an integer add, and they do a return. Should the numbers be large integers, the add will overflow, and you'll end up with a negative result, all according to the Java specification. So writing this function in JavaScript, it looks like this. I don't see a single int anywhere. I just see A and B, which are something that can be added. So 
what, what, what do I compile this to when I want to, to get it to run on bytecode? And especially since instant overflow in JavaScript, they get into 33 or 34 bits if I just add large ones and just keep on, like, it's all a number to JavaScript, right? It's so dynamic, it's just a number. We don't have different flavors of numbers there. So this is a rather big problem to get like, a loosely typed language to run in strongly typed bytecode. It's one of the two big problems. Uh, and the other problem, as I was alluding to earlier, is that things change at runtime quite a lot. You swap out functions with other functions. You have to invalidate assumptions. You have to check if this is still the same function. Dispatch is a lot more dynamic, so you have to swap out code with other code all the time, which is no easy way to do in Java. If you want to change a method with another one, you basically have to get rid of the class and load a new one with a new class loader. So it's hard to swap out code without a code. It's not as easy as in C, where you just like, here's a function pointer, overwrite it with another function. So, so this is a big problem as, as well, because bytecode wasn't originally designed for it. Um, so what people have done before Invoke Dynamic, which I'm getting to, is they did their own dispatch mechanisms, like, like an array dispatch table with interface calls or whatever, to figure out where is this call going now, and, uh, and uh, the JVM could never figure out what you were doing or optimize that efficiently. Whereas if you just have a direct Java code, the JVM knows that A goes to B, inline B, optimize B. Like, it's, it's really quick. So it's no doubt that the extra layer of indirection that the JVM is and the bytecode is cost us performance if we're implementing a dynamic language. So how can we work around it? We can just passively wait because the JITs are getting better all the time and the GCs are getting better all the time and just use objects for everything, like a Java lang integer instead of an int and call your add function, and sure, I mean, it translates to bytecode, it's Turing complete, it works, it's slow, and someone will optimize this eventually on the JVM level, but it's definitely not gonna be enough. So what you need is to be given tools so you can punch through the indirection layer, tools like Invoke Dynamic, uh, which is sort of the, okay, I'm, I'm really bad at, at uh, metaphors here, it's the ice pick through which you can cut appropriately sized holes through the indirection layer. This is getting a bit weird, but I, I was like last minute looking for clip art here. So uh, um, Invoke Dynamic is the most powerful uh, tool that you've been given since the inception of Java. Uh, it's basically a new bytecode, uh, a new kind of call, a new kind of data linkage. Um, it's the first new bytecode since 1996, when Java was, was, uh, was uh, uh, originally created, which uh, says something about how important it is. But it's more than, than just a new type of call. Um, it actually breaks the constraints of like, how Java calls and Java linkage works, compile time, runtime. You can have a completely custom linkage because Invoke Dynamic, you resolve everything at runtime when you see an Invoke Dynamic instruction. And you can implement things with it, I'll show you how, that act like function pointers. You can basically say A goes to B, but no, A now goes to C, this call, and just swap it out and without any elaborate mechanisms that you code up in bytecode, you can just reposition the target of a call using Invoke Dynamic. You can even implement your own custom data access with Invoke Dynamic. It doesn't have to be a call like that. It could be like a loading data from a database in a lazy manner. Uh, I'll show you that as an example as well. So Invoke Dynamic basically gets rid of all the Java constraints for call-like instructions. And, um, the whole point is that the JVM can optimize this because when it sees an invoke dynamic, it sees a function call that goes somewhere, a well-known target, uh, which it can inline. And if you choose to change that target, the JVM can back off that inlining, back off that optimization and redo it. It knows what you're trying to do when you see an invoke dynamic instruction. So I'll, I'll go through like very quickly how, how to use invoke dynamics, which is something that when you generate Java bytecode for your language, um, that, that's your use case. Uh, Java C for, uh, for Java 8 actually spits out Invoke Dynamics and uses it to implement Lambdas as well. So it has several um, benefits. Um, the JVM encounters an Invoke Dynamic bytecode when it's executing a program uh, for the first time, which is a call somewhere. I mean. In just like an invoke interface or an invoke virtual or an invoke static or whatever the other invocations that uh, are rather self-explanatory call Java methods with Java semantics, invoke dynamic looks at first just like another call. But the important difference is that the first time we encounter an invoke dynamic in the JVM, uh, the invoke dynamic calls something called a bootstrap method, which is something you write yourself in Java 
which is sets up the linkage for this call. It tells the JVM where this call goes and returns something called a call site, which corresponds that program to the program point where the invoke dynamic is. This, call, this is a call site here, and a call site has a target. This invoke dynamic calls something, the target, which is represented by a method handle. And, and I like to liken the method handle to a function pointer, but there are language purists sometimes that, uh, that um, yell at me for, for doing that. But the method handle is basically an opaque way of referring to a Java method or a method, a bytecode method. So that's how the invoke dynamic call chain works. And every other time you get to the invoke dynamic, the bootstrap method is never called again. You just invoke the method handle that you specified as the target, and uh, the JVM will know what you're trying to do. It will inline the target, it will optimize the target. So you have a dispatch mechanism that looks very much like a standard call, only you set up the target at runtime, not at compile time. This is an example of how a bootstrap method looks. It takes a lookup mechanism, it takes a name, which is like a constant name for this call site, it takes a method type, which is like, what does this call, what, what are the parameters of this call, what's the return value of this call, and it takes any number of compile time constants as meta info that you can send to the, uh, to the method. And what you do basically is you, you create a method handle in some way, um, you can look up any Java class, um, like Java lang string replace whatever, uh, with the lookup mechanism or your own bytecode or whatever. You get a method handle which is, corresponds to this place in the program, this code, and then you wrap it in a call site object. In this case, I have subclassed call site to my mutable call site, um, which means that this is a call site that I can change the target for. I can say that I don't want this call to go to whatever name and type was, I want it to go here instead. But there's also constant call sites and various other call sites. And you can subclass call sites, add profiling counters, call counters in them, and do anything that will happen every time the, the call is executed, which is pretty cool. So if you're a mutable call site, you can, you can reset the target, and the invoke dynamic will suddenly go somewhere else, which is absolutely essential if you implement a dynamic language. A constant call site that will never change. You can just get the target, and the JVM loves the constant call sites because it knows that I can inline these and forever. This optimization will be true. Another powerful thing with method handles is that you can combine them with other method handles. So you can add guards to them. You can add argument filters. You can add return value filters. You can remove arguments and add arguments, etc. So you can do a lot of program logic just by combining method handles with method handle combination functions. I'll show you a little bit how it works. There's also a mechanism called a switch point, which is quite powerful, which uh, you can associate with any call site in the program. And when you invalidate the switch point with volatile semantics seen by all threads, everyone, like every call site that, that used the switch point will now be positioned somewhere else. The switch point is like first A, then B upon invalidation. You invalidate it, and all the callers of A will now call B in the entire program, which is very powerful. So you have an asynchronous mechanism to swap out code now in, in, in Java. Um, JavaScript is a, a very ungrateful language to work with because you have very little type information at compile time. Uh, for instance, here in this adder function, we only know uh, what, what, what A and B are at runtime. When we link the call, we see that, okay, right now, the results of F and G, which are the parameters to the add function, they're int. That's fine, then we can do like, um, uh, the equivalent of a Java int add, which is the one I showed you before, that takes ints and returns the int sum and everything is fine. Well, I'm, I'm skipping past the overflow case here. I'm just trying to make a point. But if at runtime, there's no guarantee that f will always ret return an int. It can start returning strings and whatever, and then this turns into a string concatenation because the plus operator in JavaScript does everything. So you need some kind of fallback, which is like a more generic implementation of the adder, you take A and B as objects, and then you execute something like JavaScript add, which is, implements the plus operator in JavaScript. There's probably several, several hundred bytecodes looking. Are they strings? Are they ints? What are they doubles? Whatever, return a boxed object. Um, you really don't want this to happen. The, the most generic case, you can implement the perfectly working JavaScript implementation by just using the generic case, but it's not gonna be fast. So, 
Uh, if you have the parameter types at runtime and only you don't know what F and G are, you can use one mechanism to combine method handles. You can use a guard. I mean, you want to check if these are ints, you can use the int adder. So you implement something like this, a method that returns a Boolean and takes two values, checks that they're of the type integer. I'm using box types now. I hope that the JVM can unbox them. And I'll use method handles guard with test, which is in the uh, JDK, in the Java Lang invoke package, and say that for um, take this add int method and take this add object method um, and, go, and use an int guard. Uh, if the int guard is true, call the first one, otherwise call the second one. And I turn this into a new method handle called add, capital ADD there, which is a guarded adder, which will, according to what F and G are, if both of them are ints, it will always dispatch to the add int, and otherwise it will dispatch to the add object. So if I just keep calling this add with capital ADD, I will call the fast function when at runtime I know the types. There, could, there is, of course, a type check, which is a little heavy, uh, but nowhere near just using the object method every time. And I didn't write any explicit code for this. I wrote a guard, and I did like combine two method handles to another one. JavaScript, you can have function call reassignment a lot. Here we have a square function that returns the square of x. We have a multiplication function that returns x times 2. And we have some computation that returns the square of a parameter plus the multiply function of a parameter. And um, of course, someone can do this and say that multiply is now replaced by a function that returns x times 3 instead of x times 2 and call compute again. And um, this call here. Can't, can't go there anymore if I, re, re, if I re, redesign, redefine multiply. I have to update the multiply function in compute whenever it's overwritten by something else, or I'll break the semantics. So, so this, is, this is a big uh oh That was really hard to do before invoke dynamic, um, because I had to have my own dispatch table saying someone's replaced multiply, which multiply is there, and do something horrible thing with interface invocation, probably. That's how, how JRuby did it before invoke dynamic. Uh, but right now, I just like with a switch point or with um, a guard or something else, I can just relink this multiply and say, well, oh, this, the target of this call site now goes to, to this function, x times 3. And, and, and I have all these tools in the JDK now to help me do that. So another example of custom data access is that you have a call site with one value available only at runtime. Instead, if you load something from a database, it takes a lot of time. Uh, normally in Java, if you have a constant that will be like forever a constant, you can do a static final field and initiate it to something. But this won't work because the system has to be up and running and the class with the static final field is loaded already when you actually have access to the database connection or whatever. So, but you still have the concept that the value is calculated once and remains immutable. And even though you don't manipulate bytecode here, you can use the method handle framework to solve the problem. You can do a uh, constant call site, which contains a method handle that basically says, I am a constant function. I always return a data class, and um, this is the value. Load data from database when you're ready, when the database is up. And this function will be as, just as final as the static final approach, only I initiate it late. I have the runtime linkage there. It's actually more final than the static final field, but let's not get into that. So you can do a lot with data access and call sites with Invoke Dynamic, and there's plenty of tutorials on the net right now that are really good if you want to know more about it. So Java 8 also uses Invoke Dynamic, delegators with Lambda. We implement them quite heavily using Invoke Dynamic, and uh, it actually now outperforms the old uh, anonymous inner classes way that we uh, had in our initial implementations. So that was the uh, crash course in uh, the tools to implement dynamic languages on the JVM. I want to spend some time on the Nasrm project as well, a couple of slides. How many of you have ever heard of the Nasrm project? Well, it's a bit about a couple of people in there. So what is it? It's a 100 pure Java, 100% pure Java implementation of, of a runtime for JavaScript. It's written completely in Java. It um, generates bytes code um, to implement JavaScript and invoke dynamics because of the dynamic nature of JavaScript are everywhere in the, in the generated byte code. Um, for Java 8, um, Nashorn will perform somewhere between two to 10, ten times better than Rhino, I think. So it's a, it's a mature replacement for Rhino. It is in Java JDK 8. You can already download it uh, with the developer builds. 
it is 100 ECMA script compliant, which means that it passes uh, the ECMA script JavaScript test suite of some 11,000 tests. We were actually the first JavaScript runtime in the world to do that. I think others have caught up now, but that was kind of cool. And we spent a significant part of last year thinking about security for the Java platform and um, NAS run as well. So we have a well, very well thought through security model when it comes to executing mobile code uh, through this framework. Um, I can't possibly comment on Java and security, but it seems that we're running a tight ship these days. That's all I can say. So we started Nazarene as a proof of concept for Invoke Dynamic in late 2010 because we needed to know that, I mean, does it work? Have we forgotten anything? Will the JVM be able to compile this to something that goes fast? And Rhino is still alive today after 18 years. Why? Well, that's because of JSR223, the JavaX scripting API. People can call Java from JavaScript and JavaScript from Java, and that's why they still use Rhino. So it seemed natural to go in a productization direction for this, and Nazarene is now mature and replaces Rhino for Java 8. So if Rhino were this slow, gray beast, we want to uh, turn Nazarene into something more like this, which is a, a modern rhinoceros. Nazarene, of course, means rhinoceros in German. I, I wanted Nusshörning in Swedish, but no one voted yes on that. So rationale that would pick JavaScript, it's extremely dynamic, so it would really put invoke dynamic and the Java Lang invoke mechanisms to a test because almost all getters and setters and calls have to be invoke dynamics if you implement JavaScript as bytecode. And Rhino is slow and old and um, it should be easy to, to write proof of concept apps because you have the JDK to fall back on through the scripting API. Uh, we bumped into a lot of VM problems. Uh, Hotspot wasn't really prepared to um, um, optimize Invoke Dynamic call sites when we started. It didn't inline as well as it should. We found a lot of problems with that. We worked just closely with the uh, JIT compiler team to make sure that this new kind of bytecode actually runs fast and good as, as, like, as, as Java bytecode should. Um, this is a slide from like, the first time we passed the ECMA script compliance test. Uh, not so proud of it anymore since people have, uh, have uh, other, other runtimes uh, are there, but uh, we were certainly the first, which is cool. JavaScript is, is like an insane language. The stuff that you normally see as a JavaScript programmer uh, doesn't have anything to do with it, but the stuff you have to support to be fully compliant JavaScript can drive anyone mentally insane. Um, this is a performance slide. It's a bit dated. It's actually uh, a few months old, which uh, shows Rhino versus Nazarene performance on, on, on the uh, Octane benchmark, which is a common JavaScript benchmark. So you shouldn't read too much into um, to, um, small benchmarks like that, but rather look into your own um, applications. Uh, but we can see that we pretty much beat um, Rhino on anything we try. And the interesting thing is one of the benchmarks display there, we even beat uh, V8, the native implementation, because it's memory bound and uh, the garbage collectors in Hotspot are very good. So we get more throughput than, than V8 on that particular thing, which is quite promising. Um, but this is just the beginning. Um, we are, as of late August, no longer understaffed for performance work. It's been like a Java 8 death march, but uh, we haven't had time to look so much at performance, but now we spent almost two months three guys looking at um, a new performance model for Nashorn. And uh, we're trying for native-like performance, V8-like performance, both by working on the JVM, modifying the Invoke Dynamic implementation, and changing the somewhat conservative type model that Nashorn uses when it compiles code. So we know some things at runtime, and we use them for types in Nashorn right now. But we don't know a lot because it's JavaScript, and you don't see a lot of types. You can't deduce a lot of types. You can deduce that. If you multiply something with something, they are numbers. But if you do something plus something, you don't know anything. So uh, you can use what you have. Um, you have to support, um, you have to have fast support for things like add operations. Add operations can't just be an int add in bytecode because they may overflow. But so you need to like weave very customized assembly code for uh, a JavaScript int add that actually does something when, when you get an overflow. You need support for that. Uh, the implementation of uh, method handles in the JVM contains something called Lambda forms, which initially didn't perform too well, but uh, it's getting a lot better because of better inlining and um, boxing elimination and other, um, uh, other optimizations done on the JVM level. So I thought I'll end the Nasrin stuff with showing like, that we can actually get native-like performance if we try with more 
optimistic type approach. So after two and a half weeks of work on the performance project, we did a very uh, initial proof of concept by breaking out the hot method of uh, one of the uh, Octane benchmarks, the crypto benchmark, uh, the function that does all the calculations, which is really integer calculations that don't overflow, but we don't know that and can't prove that. So we basically have to assume this is the case and take a penalty if we're wrong. And um, I gave an extensive talk on how this technology works at the Java Language Summit in Santa Clara this summer, and it's online as, as video and the slides as well if you're interested in how we actually can get close to native performance with bytecode. Um, so I turned this into a micro benchmark and hacked up a proof of concept, and Ryan runs it in, in, in 34 seconds with the uh, maximum optimization flag, and Nasrun Java 8 runs it in 10 seconds, and V8 runs it in 1.3 seconds, which seemed like uh, with decimal, this is bad. We can never get to native performance. So we added optimistic types, basically said, everything is an integer until proven otherwise. If it isn't, unroll the state, take continuation, and like compile a slower version of the method. I got it down to 5.8 seconds quite easily. Um, added math intrinsics so that uh, integer overflows were implemented efficiently in assembly code, 4.4 seconds. Patched the JVM to keep more type info while inlining, which is something the hotspot should have done anyway because it benefits Java as well. 2.5 seconds. Uh, I'm almost there. And uh, the work we've done the latest, um, latest couple of weeks, uh, we can now run even larger apps. Um, the methodology seems to work. And I really encourage people to check out my Nashorn War Stories talk if you want to know more about the performance effort. It's not going to be there for Java 8. We wanted to, but um, it's too late in the game right now. We want a stable release, but we're certainly going to get something in an update release that um, radically improves Nashorn performance. Uh, other applications is Avatar.js that was introduced at um, uh, Java 1. It's a server-side JavaScript thing running on the JVM an implementation of the Node programming model. So you can write entire applications in Java and JavaScript, hybridize them, yet using the Node API that you may be familiar with. Um, and, and you get the seamless JDK integration that I've been um, talking a lot about during this presentation. Uh, you have parallelism. You have background Java threads. You don't see them, but you have parallelism. And interesting thing is that Avatar.js is small enough for the embedded space, but it can also exist as a, a cloud pluggable module uh, in, in, in whatever cloud offerings that Oracle has. Check out the website. Um, this is an example of why hybrid programming using Java and JavaScript combined, writing it in Nasorn, uh, worked really well, because the development speed for this project uh, was nowhere, I mean, it, it would have been nowhere this fast if we couldn't, couldn't hybridize and use the JDK when we needed to. Now, the proof of concept that uh, Jim Lasky on my team did is the Ascari debugger, which is a meta debugger for Nasorn written in Nasorn. You can replace and view code while writing it, like a simple swing app. It took him three weeks of work to get it up and running, and he did a really impressive demo at Java 1, which is, as of today, up on the website as well, where he shows how he implemented it. It's incredibly powerful. A uh, little debugger where you can evaluate JavaScript statement, replace functions, and it just works. Ascari is one of those little birds that pick bugs from, from rhinoceri, I think. So that's, that's the name. And, and as I said, Nasrum is already an open JDK 8. You can uh, sync out the repo today and check out the code and build it and test it. And we're working on performance enhancement, both in Nasrum and the JVM. And as it's an open JDK project, we want the community to contribute. We want functionality, testing, performance analysis, bug fixes. We have this guy in Switzerland is great. He runs like JS fuzz every night and produces the most weird JavaScript example that crashes every known JavaScript runtime and gives them to us, and we fix the bugs. So that's an example of a community contribution. Um, browser simulation frameworks like NJS, if someone could implement that, I'll be really happy because I don't have the time to do it. We want to see your hybrid Java solutions, your proof of concepts, guest posts on the Nasrun blog, whatever. And, and, and I mean, I really encourage you to check out the Nasrun blog and join the Nasrun mailing list if this sounds, uh, sounds interesting. I'll end with like a, just two or three slides about the DaVinci Machine project, which is the general multi-language effort on the JVM. Uh, and not just JavaScript. Can we do better than the ice pick that I showed you uh, to punch through the indirection layer? We certainly can. We can reshape the holes to whatever like, size and shape we want them. And that's the goal of the uh, MLVM, multi-language VM project, if you will. 
So, so the MLVM project is an open source incubator for JVM futures, I can call it, which contains a lot of code fragments and patches that implement different things that different dynamic languages need on the JVM. And to migrate to OpenJDK, you need a standard and a feature release plan. And this is where Invoke Dynamic and the Java Lang Invoke package were born. And they got a standard, they got a release plan, and they were migrated into Java 7. It's also a mailing list if you're interested in multi-language implementation of the JVM. Some examples of what's going on there is like, well, the method handles and invoke dynamic, of course, coroutines, uh, interface injection, which is something that uh, Scala needs for traits, tail call optimization, hard tail call optimization, which Scala, Clojure, many languages probably like. Uh, tuple types, well, there's a lot of stuff going on. Check out the website. And, and none of them are intrinsically Java traits from the beginning, but this is something that we want the JVM to support to become the ultimate multi-language polyglot runtime. So it's not just invoke dynamic as I sort of focused on, because the JVM is evolving to become the multi-language runtime with the help of these projects. And, and that's about what I had to say about polyglot JVMs today. Thank you very much. Follow me on Twitter. Ask me questions on Twitter if you, if you think of something after this. Um, otherwise, I'll be happy to take questions now. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.